the last presentation about the same subject from Quinn Grundy from Sydney. Spin in published biomedical literature, a systematic review. Thank you. So we've just had an excellent discussion about spin and I think have identified a number of sources of spin including originally perhaps propaganda and public relations, the media has been highlighted and broadly we can group these practices as a biased presentation intended at base to present matters more favorably. In the context of scientific research, we're seeing spin manifest not only as distorted interpretation of results or misleading conclusions, but also concerns over science hype, where findings are overstated. And I think the, the concerns arising from spin, particularly in research, are not only misinformed science and health policy, but misdirection of research agendas, exaggerated public expectations, and the potential for loss of public support in science and expertise should these promises fail to materialize. So we conducted a systematic review with the aim of understanding the nature and prevalence of spin in biomedical literature across disciplines, study designs, and clinical areas. So some of the questions we had included, you know, how has SPIN been studied in biomedical literature? How does it manifest? What is its prevalence? And what factors may be associated with the presence of SPIN? We included the examination of SPIN in studies of any design, not just trials. And we included all outcomes where SPIN, however defined and broadly defined, was quantitatively assessed. As has just been mentioned in the, the Q&A, SPIN is variably defined and encompasses a large variety of practices. So we were very inclusive in our search strategy and employed a number of concepts, uh, including the notion of discordance between your results and conclusions, misleading conclusions, interpretation bias, and noting that it's particularly been studied among trials with non-significant primary outcomes. So this inclusive search returned nearly 4,500 articles, and 35 met our inclusion criteria for a qualitative narrative synthesis. A number of studies had also hypothesized that industry funding might be associated with the presence of SPIN. And of those with a homogenous outcome measure, we were able to include seven in a quantitative meta-analysis. About 90% of the included studies were reviews of the literature in various clinical areas and looking at SPIN in different study designs. But two-thirds of our included studies specifically investigated SPIN in clinical trials. About 86% of the included reviews defined SPIN a priori and then sought to assess the frequency, severity, characteristics according to these pre-specified uh, definitions. So using structured, standardized data extraction forms to tally the instances of SPIN. In contrast, a minority of reviews, largely coming from uh, Isabel Boutron and her colleagues, examined SPIN inductively and they access, assessed in a more exploratory manner a range of ways that SPIN could manifest within a sample of studies. And this was often used to develop these instruments. Across our included reviews, however, we, we found SPIN to again be variably defined and we inductively classified these definitions into four main categories. So firstly, a commonly known, again, as the Boutron definition, are the reporting practices which distort the interpretation of results or create misleading conclusions, suggesting a more favorable result. And then there are the group of studies that specifically define spin as discordance between results and their conclusions. However, for studies, particularly that are observational in design, SPIN could also manifest as the attribution of causality uh, where this was inappropriate. Or finally, and much more broadly, the overinterpretation or inappropriate extrapolation of results. 
A key challenge that investigators noted is that the assessment of spin is itself an exercise in interpretation and is highly contextual, and that this poses methodological challenges. So this graph shows the proportion of articles with spin in the main text across various study designs. Each circle represents a review in our systematic review, and the size of the circle corresponds to the number of articles included in each review. So you can see that on the your far left, that among trials, we saw the greatest variability in the proportion of articles containing spin, ranging from 19 to, in one review, 100% of their articles. Though the small sample sizes prevented us from statistically comparing these groups, it did appear that trials with non-significant primary outcomes or with a higher risk of bias, such as being non-randomized, appeared to have a higher prevalence of spin. So that's that second group. Few res uh, of the reviews assessed the prevalence of spin in other t study types, for example, diagnostic test accuracy studies or observational studies, but it would appear that spin remains prevalent. And two, two of the reviews assessed spin specifically in systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which demonstrated a much lower prevalence. We extracted all data on the practices used, consciously or not, to spin results among studies across different designs. And we thematically classified these into four main groups. So firstly, inappropriate interpretation given the study design. So this could be, for example, a superiority trial with a non-significant outcome, concluding that the two treatments were equally good or the use of causal language in the conclusions of an observational study. A second group of practices again refer to the inappropriate extrapolation or making recommendations for clinical practices, such as in the context of an observational study, expressing confidence in a test without suggesting the need for further confirmatory studies. A third group of practices uh, refers really to the selective reporting within a publication. So again, for example, omitting non-significant results from the abstract, but presenting them within the main text. And finally, a fourth group of practices is the presentation of conclusions more favorably than is warranted. Again, this goes back to the rhetoric. One study analyzed internal documents from a pharmaceutical company and found emails asking, how to make it sound better than it looks on the graphs. Among the included reviews, a large number hypothesized that various factors related to authors, journals, and study characteristics might be associated with spin. But none of the included reviews consistently found any of these factors to be significantly associated in the same direction with spin apart from studies with non-significant primary outcomes. Due to the heterogeneity in factors measured, only seven could be included in a meta-analysis of the association between funding source and presence of spin. And we found that industry-sponsored studies were no more likely to have spin than non-industry-sponsored sp studies. And after conducting a couple sensitivity analysis to group studies where disclosures were missing, we found the same result uh, in both categories. So spin appears to be prevalent, particularly in clinical trials, and it manifests in diverse ways. This thematic analysis could underpin the development of instruments used to assess spin across study designs and clinical areas, which could be useful for researchers in assessing their own work, but also for peer reviewers and editors. We suggest that we need to widen the investigation into the factors associated with spin. At the moment, they're highly individualized or article specific. Instead, we suggest looking at the cultures and structures around research. It's likely that certain practices may incentivize certain types of reporting. And at the moment, very little is known about these contextual factors that contribute to spin or what might be done about it. Even less is understood about the impact of spin on research, 
clinical practice or the policy environment, and we'd welcome further work in this area. Just would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Kelly Chu and Lisa Barrow. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, please. No? Uh, I have ah. a question from Twitter. Graham Steele asks, would open peer review help reduce spin? I think it could. Um, I think there's also the possibility, as Lisa mentioned in her talk, that peer review might introduce spin. Um, we were surprised that there was even a number of reviews in a review about spin that contained spin. <laughs> so not to name any names, but you know, statements, looking at some of these associated factors, again, that things were trending toward significance. These are very basic reporting conventions that just seem ir irresistible, that perhaps you know, resorting again to a very basic checklist could uh, help to mitigate. Um, I don't know that it's, it's solely the responsible of the peer reviewers or even individual researchers. Again, I think we would point to some of these incentive structures as the place to look more into how spin occurs and then how to solve it. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, Patrick Romano from UC Davis and the journal Health Services Research. Um, so I, I'm gonna be a little provocative perhaps and and say, I think that, that your review has nicely demonstrated that this concept of spin is a bit of a squishy concept. Um, and it's defined in different ways by different people. And um, what looks like spin to one person may not to another person. I think it may be because I come from a journal that publishes in health policy. Um, and so from my perspective, spin is somewhat inevitable. I mean, it comes out of the political science arena where we know that if we watch Fox News, we get one spin. We watch MSNBC, we get a different spin. Every party puts its own spin. Um, so is it possible to distinguish the, the forms of spin, if you will, that are um, inevitable, that are appropriate um, for authors, obviously, to um, interpret their own findings as they see, see fit and to suggest um, ways in which the literature may evolve from the forms of spin that are more malignant, if you will, um, as, as previous questioners have suggested, that really represent clear misinterpretations of the findings. So, so I think that would, be, that would be important. To some extent, we may also need to do more to educate um, the readers um, mm -hmm. and stakeholders that some degree of spin is healthy. It's part of the process of intellectual discussion and debate. Um, and that we have to have our, um, our ears up for it. We have to recognize it. We have to push back. But it's all pro part of a, a, a robust process of discussion and debate sometimes. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think, first of all, there, there's a gap in the empirical literature <laughs> here, again, on the impact of spin. So we don't empirically have a good sense of what types of spin are actually affecting readers and decisions. So that's a key piece that's missing. Um, again, Boutron and colleagues, they did a, an investigation, I believe it was in the context of systematic reviews, where they did an expert survey to rank the severity of different types of spin. And so I think we can begin to differentiate between those that are, are truly on the side of falsification versus those that are interpretation. And I myself am a qualitative researcher, so I certainly am not in a position for advocating against interpretation. And I think we live in an area where expertise actually has a role to play in interpreting empirical findings, but that, that needs to happen very rigorously and transparently, and no more trending towards significance. But just to come back to this question, what is the role of interrate variability? When you give a paper to read to five researchers and you ask them to rate the spin degree on a scale of 1 to 100 or whatever, I'm sure that, that they will not reach the same result. 
Absolutely, and, and I think that's again what our review shows is that spin is, is not a unified concept and that it does differ across study design. It's highly contextual, so I think a measure of you know, spin on a scale of zero to 100 is not appropriate, and so a checklist would have to be nuanced. It would have to be taking spin in context. Okay, there are four questions left, starting. David Schreiger, UCLA. Following on the last question, so much of this Congress is about this notion that if we only eliminate bias and spin from the literature, we'll have a better literature. But I just question whether that's really the right model. If you think of a court of law, everyone's aware that the plaintiff and defense act, you know, lawyers are putting as much spin as possible on the case, and, and the, there's an interested party that's interested in sorting all that out and trying to find the truth. Is the problem with our literature not so much the way that we create articles or report articles, but the fact that there really isn't a community in medical science that's actively vetting the stuff, in that most articles are, you know, their greatest value is to the person who wrote it, in that they get a notch on their CV. And in fact, you know, you look at PubMed Commons, it's basically barren. There's almost no discussion of any of the articles to see, is this article of merit or not? So I just wonder, is the issue really an issue of there's spin creeping into the articles or the fact that no one cares to sort it out? Yeah, and I, mean, I think that's again why we want to place emphasis on these contextual and structural problems that have been ignored. Um, Lisa in her, in her talk this morning highlighted the number of things that, that authors are now being asked for. I think the last few papers I've written, you have to provide a tweet. You have to summarize your findings in 140 characters. These things are not reviewed. They're not vetted. Your universities are happy for you to attract whatever media attention you can, whether that's positive, negative, spun. Um, and yet, I think more than ever, it's important that experts are having these conversations and providing interpretation. And I would argue that we, we need a science of interpretation. Qualitative research, social sciences may have a lot to offer to that conversation. Verti Salahim from the Finnish Medical Journals, Journal, we are all humans and like our own ideas and like them to be uh, found evidence on them. Uh, you said that you didn't find any, any uh, connection with the uh, correlation with the uh, industry sponsor. And in abstract book, you explain this negative finding. Uh, by the uh, possible heterogeneity of these seven included articles. Is this also a kind of a spin? Mm, absolutely. And I think we, we certainly have the tendency to, uh, I was commenting this the other day, that if it's a positive finding, it must be true. And if it's a negative finding, it's probably a small sample size or heterogeneity. Um, I think in this case, it's also quite possible, I was thinking about this, that industry-sponsored research has less reason to spin so going back to those contextual findings, if they're, you know, we've talked about publication bias, if they're already publishing high-profile trials with high-profile authors, perhaps, uh, you know, they're getting into these higher impact factor journals, they're already attracting the media attention. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's other explanations. Uh, Kay Dickerson, Johns Hopkins. Um, Maybe it's what people have already said, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think all of us really have to look at ourselves, too, because I always say to ourselves and our, my co-authors, well, we've been taught to tell a story in our publications, and is telling a story spin? And so I'd really like to see us examine ourselves in the future to see whether we are spinning by telling a good story. Yeah, and I think the comment though earlier, um, this idea that there are, there are certain spin practices that are actually omitting things or falsifying, and I do think that is categorically different than telling a story with your findings, which, which I would believe is actually essential. But trying to separate some of these out um, I think that's work that needs to be done. Adrian Scooperman, farmed out Georgetown. Industry-funded studies are almost always spun, and my question to you is whether you examined the abstracts separately. So in the, our included reviews, there was a variety. So there were some who looked at abstracts alone, some that looked exclusively at the main text, and some that looked at both. 
So um, the prevalence chart that I showed you, we have a similar one for abstracts, and I, I think as um, the previous presenter uh, showed that spin in abstracts tends to be higher and more severe. But in that meta-analysis, I can just go back. I believe that this is specifically for the main text. I think also the caveats here is that, that these were across different study designs. So some of these are observational, some were meta-analyses, some are trials. And of course, the definition of spin is a little bit nebulous. So not to explain away negative results. <laughs> um, I would ad advise you to do an analysis of the industry funding with the abstracts only. I can okay. tell you one of the things that's, I think, you, um, one of the things about my project is that we have industry insiders who work with us. Industry only cares about the abstract because that's the only part that clinicians read, yeah. despite what they say. Yeah, yes. yeah, I'd be interested to hear more about your work. Any others? Yes, I try to <clears throat> read this. From Facebook, researchers aren't practicing medicine like full-time clinicians. Is research used by third-party payers? I'm sorry. <laughs> Do I start? Mm. Try it out. <laughs> researchers aren't practicing medicine like full-time clinicians. Is research used by third-party payers to establish dogma for clinicians the real spin? Perhaps. <laughs> There's a question for future research. <laughs> so again, understanding severity, understanding the impact, I think, is a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So then there is lunchtime on the second floor, and the program will continue at 1.30. Drummond will be here. <laughs>